David Smith here with one more flipped classroom math video lesson. Three tips before we start. First, remember you can adjust the playback speed to make it faster or slower as you like. Second, you can pause the video at any point to catch up on your notes or jot down some questions. Third, you can turn on the captions so you can read my words on the screen. Today's video covers the standard normal distribution and probability. But before, before we get into that, it's spirit day at my school, and I'm dressed up as a barbecue dad. Now let's make this a little easier for the lesson. Okay, so let's talk about this thing called a normal distribution. It has a graphical representation, which we're gonna to get to on the next board. But first we wanna talk about three main characteristics of the normal distribution. And then just to know, we're gonna spend the next three or four lessons using the normal distribution to figure out probabilities. So let's get started. So check this out. A normal distribution is roughly symmetrical around a central value. It's bell-shaped. You may have heard the expression, the bell-shaped curve. That refers to a normal distribution. And then finally, the majority of the outcomes are clustered around that central outcome or value. So let's take a look at the graph. All right, so here's how that looks. We have a roughly symmetrical graph with a peak around the central value, which for this is actually the mean, median, and mode. They're the same. Um, so all of our data is up there. And this is the bell-shaped curve. It looks sort of like a, a Liberty Bell. There'd be a handle here. You could pick it up and ring, ding, 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 like that. So let's take a look at some notation for this. Random variable x. Now the n here means normal distribution. And then remember, mu, this stands for the mean or the average. And then sigma squared is the variance. Okay, so average spread of data. Now the spread of data determines how wide that bell-shaped curve is. The higher this number, the flatter the peak and the wider the curve. The smaller this number, the more pointy that is. All right, I just threw some numbers on the graph so you can see how they affect our notation. So basically, I just added an x-axis to there, and we can see that right in the middle, 10 is our mean, our mu, and then our values spread out to either side of that. So now this notation would be x as a member of a normal distribution, random variable x, with a mean of 10 and a variance of 2. So the standard deviation is the square root of that number. So let's talk specifically about the standard normal distribution. So this one is really straightforward. They've pared it down. It's basically the most basic normal distribution that you can have. So let's take a look. So the average is zero, okay? So you can have negative values or positive values, but the average is gonna be zero. The mu is zero. Sigma is one. Standard deviation is one. So that's a nice, simple value for standard deviation, okay? Now, with notation with the normal standard, standard normal, normal standard, okay, not standard normal. No, that's right. So our notation is a little different. Now we use the letter Z. So random variable with the letter Z means that that variable, when you're looking at the probabilities, it falls in a standard normal distribution. So that allows you to say average is zero, Standard deviation is one. And so we write is z um, to, the, to the normal distribution, zero, one, like that, okay? So I've sketched that graph. Now let's talk about how we can use this to figure out probability, okay? So let's say I have a question. I need to find out what is the probability that my result will be between negative one and one. And the interesting thing for that is it's just the area under the curve for that interval. So if I do probability of negative one less than z less than positive one, that's going to be this area. Okay? Now you've had other ways to calculate this when you do individual probabilities of the success and failure and formulas and crunching and oftentimes repetitive calculations for every possible outcome. Now we have a graph where we can just take a look at the area underneath that graph and that will give us the probability. Now, the second cool thing is that you're gonna be able to do all of this on your calculator. 
So your calculator, you'll just enter in the parameters for your distribution and for your, your ranges, your upper and your lower bounds. You do the calculation and the calculator just tells you what the probability would be. Now I'm gonna turn you loose on another YouTube video. I found a gentleman who describes how to do these calculations on the calculator quite well. Um, so I'm gonna have you watch that when you're done with this video, but I do wanna preface that with showing you some of the different types of calculation that we might be doing on there. All right, so if you remember some of the probability problems that we've had so far, you've had to calculate the probability for something like, what if the outcome is less than two? What would I be calculating for that? And we can show that graphically on the curve quite easily. That would just be this entire region, the area under the curve for all of the blue, okay? So we're just going down from two all the way down. Now there's a special trick here. You can't put in zero for your lower bound. You have to put in something else. The guy in the video is gonna explain how that works. But basically, the probability of rent variable z being less than two is just the area under the curve from two all the way down to where it pinches out. Okay, one last variation. We could figure out the probability that rent variable z falls between negative three and positive one. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video and see if you can shade your graph with the correct area for the area under the curve. All right, so I just shaded the area under my curve with the green from negative three, so that's all of this all the way up to positive one. So that area is gonna represent the probability of getting outcomes in that range. Okay, so now what I want you to do is finish this video. You wanna pull out your calculator. I've got a TI-84 calculator video for you and a TI-Inspire calculator video for you. Click the link, watch the video, go along with your calculator, make sure that you can do these types of problems and then you're done. Now that you've watched the video, take a moment to jot down any additional notes, some questions, or a quick summary of the lesson. You can also re-watch the portions of the video that were a little bit challenging for you. If you enjoyed the video, please click like, and if you'd like to help me grow my YouTube channel, please click subscribe.